you can confirm if you can hear our audio. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. All Thanks. right. Thank you so much, Sandeep. Uh, good morning, everyone, um, and good morning, Sandeep. It's really, really, really glad to welcome you to the leadership talk series at XLR at Jamshedpur. Uh, my batchmate, Arijit Datta, who also happens to be formally associated with PwC, will do a welcome address, and we can take it ahead from there on. So over to you, Arijit. Thank you, Namrata. So should I start or wait for a few minutes to, uh, for a few people to join? Um, I think we can get started. You can do the welcome note and we'll have people joining in as well. Uh, sure. Uh, so, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker for today, Mr. Sandeep Kumar Mohanty, who is going to talk to us on the topic of climate change and role in consulting. So, this is a subject in which we should all be deeply interested because mitigating and adapting to the effects of climate change is the defining challenge of uh, present and future generations. Uh, so we as consultants can be the key partners in overcoming the technical barrier faced by many institutions in assessing climate change risk to natural and social systems. Now to introduce Sandeep, uh, he has over 10 years of rich experience in management consulting in energy infrastructure and utility space. He is a director in the PwC advisory line of service. In the last 10 years, he has advised corporates, investors, and funds on investments and market entry, both inbound and outbound investments across the energy and infrastructure landscape. In addition to India, he has worked in South Asia, Middle East, and Africa. Uh, Sandeep is a postgraduate in business with an engineering degree in computer science. So I had the privilege of attending uh, Sandeep's few sessions during my PwC days. So to say the least, it was an enriching experience for me. Hope this feeling will be shared by all after today's session. So once again, please join me in welcoming home, Sandeep. Uh, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Well, thank you, Arijit and Namrata for, uh, for your kind words. Um, so um, I hope I'm audible to everyone. There's no issue. Uh, yes, Sandeep, you are audible. Uh, so the good morning to all. Um, I'm Sandeep Kumar Mohanty. Uh, in fact, I was born and brought up in Jamshedpur, the city where he was spending two years of your life. was my home for a good 17 odd years uh, till I moved out for my graduation. So I feel quite nostalgic as I speak to you today. Uh, but enough of those emotions. Uh, you know, today I wish to talk about two things. And actually, I think uh, the poster kind of conveyed uh, a mixed meaning. Uh, so essentially, I want to talk to you about two different things. One is share my experience from the consulting world and Arijit can probably relate to that given his prior experience. Uh, you know, in most pre-placement or corporate talks, you would typically hear about facts, right? For example, company ABC is present in 150 countries, employs 250,000 people, so on and so forth. Uh, but at this stage, I wanted to share some real experience, so, you know, give you a flavor of the life in consulting industry. Uh, I, I hope that also influences your decision uh, in pursuit of uh, your career. The second topic I wanted to discuss is a topic close to my heart, which is pertaining to climate change. Uh, I do believe that climate change is real, and I believe that uh, we need to recognize the challenge. Uh, all of you will be joining you know, the corporate world soon, and in times you will be in positions of authority, your decisions and actions will matter. And in fact, you will have the power to change. So, uh, you know, we'll take out 10, 15 minutes of our time today to talk about climate change, which itself is a big topic. Uh, and I would like to focus on climate finance uh, to be very specific. Uh, and for all, you know, finance enthusiasts out, out there, this could be a real career thing that you can pursue. Um, and one more point, uh, please call me Sandeep or Sandy during any conversations or Q&A. So uh, we'll follow that as a protocol. Uh, so let's begin. Uh, let me, I have, a, I have made a few slides for you guys. And so let me just project that. Okay. Cool. I hope it's visible. Right. So you know, like all good things, let's start with some context. And this section is all about, you know, what consulting 
industry looks like and what kind of work we do uh, to basically help you make a judicious choice uh, in a year's time. So like all good things, let's start with context. I mean, what do consultants actually do? Now, if you browse through corporate websites of consulting firms or read through any papers and so on and so forth, you'll hear several fancy terms like strategy and digital transformation, supply chain transformation, et cetera, et cetera. Now, all of it is true. Consulting firms do offer these set services. Uh, but if I were to describe our role in a more basic fashion, consulting firms basically solve problems. Corporates, companies hire consultants to solve a problem, a problem that they are unable to solve uh, on their own. And these problems can be varied. And that's where these fancy terms uh, or what in consulting industry called as offerings or products becomes relevant. For example, you know, uh, a board of a company can approach uh, stating that his company is not growing quickly. Uh, what should he do? Or, you know, somebody else who wants to grow even faster, what should they do? Now, these are what we call a strategic problem. So you call in those experts who can think out of the box and completely change the direction of the company at the highest level. Uh, let's look at a separate example. You know, a taxi rental company, for example, comes to you uh, who still does, you know, uh, taxi bookings over phone and shares that he wants to do business like Uber and Ola. And he wants uh, you to help him go digital. That is, help him to change his processes, oversee his app development, uh, change his customer experience, uh, and this time you, you need professionals from the digital transformation to get involved. So you see the reasons that corporates hire consulting can be different, the expertise requirement can be different, the approach and the tools can be different, but it is essentially there to solve a problem. So you need a problem uh, to resolve for a consultant to get involved. So, so that's all what we do basically. So let's, you know, uh, with that basic premise, let's take a journey uh, on what my, uh, you know, typical weeks look like uh, when I took up an, take up an engagement. So it's a journey of what my job looks like. So, you know, an Indian corporate, let's call it company A, uh, which does a lot of business overseas uh, in US and Africa specifically. Um, it has a profit before tax of about 400 to 430 million. And, it spends roughly about 30 to 40 million per annum on electricity consumption. Uh, it consumes roughly 300 million units of electricity, which in turn generates about 200, uh, 0.24 to 0.25 million tons of carbon each year. Now, the company approached us with two basic problem statements. A, it wanted us to save costs. So, you know, if we reduce even 1 million out of its 30 to 40 million power cost, it directly adds to its PBT. And second, uh, you know, as a responsible company, or uh, at least to appear so, because it does a lot of work overseas, uh, it also wanted to save on its emissions, right? So these were the two problem statements that we had. So what was the first job? The first job was to break up this problem statement, right? And if you look at uh, the as cost as a whole, so 30 to 40 million, what does it comprise of? It comprises of first rate, right? Uh, so company A pays about 11 cents of per unit of electricity. So that's great for us. So my first problem statement here was that can I reduce the cost of power from 11 cents? Uh, we went about evaluating different technologies like solar, wind, biomass, uh, even small hydro-based technologies in terms of price, in terms of ease of setting up, life of the asset, investment requirement. Uh, and we did a lot of uh, you know background analytics to zero in one or a combination of more than one uh, that offered the best return of investment for the client. Now, once our return of investment to the technology was finalized, uh, the next question was who will invest? Uh, company A could invest, certainly. However, this is not a scope business and he may not be the most efficient guy to, this, uh, to invest. So we then in turn evaluated that how can we get another company, uh, let's call it company B, whose core job is to set up these technologies um, and to invest in this project in a mutually beneficial manner. So something that benefits both A and B. So we designed that structure and we helped company A to identify that company B, negotiate the arrangement and execute the contract. Uh, so that closed one part of the equation, right? We reduced the unit cost of electricity from 11 to about 7, 8 cents, all inclusive. Now, the second part of the problem statement was company A consumes 300 unit, you know, million units of electricity. So that's volume for you. Uh, can we reduce this volume? So 
no, uh, this seems more difficult. Uh, I'm just saying because company A owns offices, it owns machines. Offices and machines need electricity to run and we cannot shut them down. <clears throat> so we looked a little deeper. Uh, you know, first we looked at what you call as energy ratings of machines. So, you know, uh, just to give you some correlation, when you look at advertisement of air conditioners, for example, uh, they talk about five star rating. So essentially what this rating tells us is how energy efficient your air condition can be. <clears throat> Just to give you an example, a five-star rating AC can save about 20 to 25% uh, electricity over one-star AC. So, so basically it consumes less electricity. So we did something very similar to that. We looked at uh, you know, all the machinery or office equipment that is being used. And wherever possible, uh, we suggested uh, to shift to more energy efficient uh, equipment. For example, you know, changing office lighting to LED systems, et cetera. So that was the first bit. Uh, second bit is we looked at uh, if there is electricity getting wasted and how can we help to conserve it? Uh, for example, uh, you know, we suggested intelligent air conditioning systems, intelligent lighting systems that can switch on and off when somebody is in the room or when the temperature or luminosity has reached, reached a certain threshold. Uh, and we, of course, uh, you know, recommended certain change to reduce this weightage. So long story short, we brought down the consumption with about 10, 8 to 10 percent from 300 million units. Um, end result, company A saves about, uh, you know, 25 to 27 percent of electricity costs. That's roughly about 8 to 11 million dollars per annum, which completely gets added to its profit. Uh, in turn, it got 50 to 100 times of the value of money that it paid to a consultant such as us. So this is what you know problem solving looks like. I mean, essentially, if you join a consulting firm, you will see variations of it, but it's all boils down to problem solving. So uh, now let me address an elephant in the room, who joins consulting. Uh, the reality is that in consulting, we can come from any background because consulting firms value differentiation in ideas. They do not want the normal. They want you to think out of box. However, this also means that you have to be very strong in your fundamentals, whatever your expertise is. So for example, you know, largely if you see in, uh, in B school, students who are majoring in finance, they hope to join an investment banking firm or an equity research firm. Those keen on technology, they look at a tech product or an IT firm. Uh, the reality is, however, that in my first year um, post-college, I did more finance than my friends in IBANs, independently managing you know, business plans, financial restructuring plans, so on and so forth. I did more process and high-level organization strategy work compared to my friends in manufacturing or HR industry. Now, my objective is not to sell the job because it also has its drawbacks. You, know? uh, you need to have a very quick learning uh, cycle. It's very quick and very short. You're expected to learn on the job. Uh, you have to work as per client schedules. So often Saturdays and Sundays at times can become uh, just a fallacy for you. Uh, and you need to keep traveling for a better part of your life. And at times it can be physically and mentally draining, uh, no matter how you know, lucrative it sounds up front. Uh, and, you know, believe me, some of the brightest guys that I've seen in my life, uh, they can't adjust to the consulting life and they quit, they move on to better things. So think before you commit, it, it has its own pros and cons, just like any, uh, you know, any organization. Now, if you look at the way that consulting firms are organized, and it will reflect to the point that I'm talking about in expertise, most, uh, most organizations, I mean, most of these consulting firms are organized in a mess structure. Uh, what this implies is that the, uh, that the verticals uh, uh, basically represents uh, what we call as industry experts. So experts in telecommunications, experts in pharma, IT, insurance, banking, or even energy sector. Right? And the horizontals, they basically represent functional experts, so experts in finance, technology, risk, legal, tax, deal, so on and so forth. The reason for such structure is that in order to win over a client, as a consultant, you need to know more about your client's business and their problems, uh, more than them actually. So, so you need a deep expertise as you grow or as you graduate in your career in the firm. Uh, and you know, as, you, as your uh, career progresses, you will tend to get aligned into one of these boxes. Uh, which is both basically uh, intersection of horizontal and vertical. So essentially, 
you will be you will become like a risk expert in pharma industry in after 10 years. So that's the super specialization at some point you're looking at. Uh, long story short, uh, this has been what my journey, uh, you know, uh, my journey over the last 10 years has been. Uh, I would also like to take you through, you know, what essentially uh, a career in consulting looks like. Again, a very real experience of uh, what I have seen, right? So, so that's what uh, we're going to talk about. But there are three essential areas to the job. Uh, first, the work we do. Uh, second, the people we work with, uh, that's basically our colleagues. And third, the firm we work for. Now, if I superimpose all these elements across uh, stages of a consultant's life, you know, the first, which is the entry level, which, uh, which stays up to, you know, four to six years, uh, you try to become a proficient worker. You spend about 70 to 80 percent of your time on work, you spend 10 percent of your time to learn from your colleagues, and 10 percent of your time to network with clients. Uh, and then, of course, you have uh, you know, you need to spend some time on firm compliance. So, I think most of you come from organization background, you would know that firms would have their own rules, and you, you spend a substantial amount of time also to abide by those rules. Uh, as you graduate up and you enter into mid-management levels, you tend to spend 50% of your time in work, 20 to 30% of time managing teams, and 20 to 30% of time managing clients. Uh, you will essentially uh, independently manage both team and work stream. Quality is at this stage is expected out of you. And third, which is when you graduate to senior levels, uh, you start spending just about 10 to 20% of time in work. Uh, you'll spend 20 to 30 percent time on team building and about 50 percent or more time in external networking that's basically interacting with clients and so on and so forth uh, so at this point you are expected to manage a practice multiple teams multiple clients uh, you transition into a mentor for your team members and an expert for the firm so you know this is what the simple stages of my job looks like uh, However, job itself has two faces to it. And if you want to succeed in this consulting world, you need to be a, you need to be a, be a proficient worker. So you need to be an expert and very good at the work that you do, that's one. And second, you also need to be a rainmaker, which essentially means that uh, you need to be able to walk into a corporate office, talk to a client and win projects for the for your company. And that's easier said than done, but I think, uh, People uh, who succeed in consulting, they find the biggest joy in being a rainmaker. Right? So uh, if you want to succeed and reach the highest levels, then you need to have both qualities, a proficient worker to begin with, and then become a rainmaker gradually as you, uh, as you grow in your career. So uh, I'll take a pause here. You know, uh, This is all I had to share uh, about life as a consultant um, and i hope that i'm able to share something which is more real um, so so we could take a pause here probably a five minutes pause uh, or two three minutes pause um, and we could then talk about uh, climate change and green finance hello uh, hello sandeep hi yeah, hi. My name is Abhijit. Very good morning. Good morning. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so, like for preparing for consulting interviews, uh, I have seen uh, that many a times in many forums it has been mentioned that uh, trust is very important. Like whenever the consulting interview also happens or in future if you get into consulting, uh, until the company can see that we can trust you. We cannot hire you because if we can't trust you, how can we be ensured that the clients uh, can trust that particular consultant? So the trust is a very key factor here. So uh, could you please suggest us that how can a person build that quality uh, so that they can particularly, you know, uh, leverage on that? Okay. Uh, well, look, I mean, trust is a factor for any interview that you go to. Uh, but, you know, I've led a few interviews myself in several of these schools. Look, the challenge for an interviewer often is that he gets 
what, about 15 to 30 minutes with, uh, with the candidate. And within this period, he needs to judge. So I think more important than trust, it is the fitment that a person looks at. I mean, whether this, if I'm, let's say, if I'm, uh, you know, if I'm interviewing Arijit for the firm, then, you know, does he look like a person who can fit in into the organization? Uh, you know, play with the, play by the rules of the organization. He can blend well with the colleagues, work with them. Uh, he can show similar traits, what it, what it takes to succeed in the firm. So these are easier said than done. And often it's a matter of, you know, what clicks. Uh, but I think there is no defined way to show that uh, you can be trustworthy or you can, you can have a good fitment. Um, I think the best thing that you can do for yourself is never to be desperate for a job because you do have a pedigree, right? You're, one of, you're there in one of the best preschools in India. Uh, you will find a job. So no need to be desperate for a job. Uh, and if you're not desperate for a job, if you're keen and calm, if you're, if you're calm in your interview, uh, you know, it shows uh, during the discussion. And I think uh, once you're calm and confident, uh, you convey your true self uh, to the interview, you will find a company where, where you fit best. And I think fitment uh, in long run is absolutely essential uh, for your growth uh, in a company. So you should fit. Uh, you should fit with your colleagues. You should fit with your managers. Trust, I think, comes naturally. Uh, it's, it's just a subset of it. You know, I, I don't think specifically interviewers look for trust because... Uh, you know, when they're coming to a B school, they believe that you have the pedigree. So what they really look for is fitment in the organization. So be true to yourself and you will find the right firm. Never be desperate for any job. Thank you very much for this. Yeah. Actually, we couldn't see you, sir. Like, I think your video is switched off. Uh, Okay, could be my Zoom application. Um, I'll switch it on. I think let's go through the discussion and then I can switch it on while the sure. Sure. Thank you. All right. Uh, so shall we move to climate uh, climate change and more importantly, climate finance? Uh, so before that, I have a follow-up question. Yes, Andrew. So when you say uh, uh, you look for pigment, what kind of traits are you talking about? So, so look, I mean, there are different people and it all depends on who is coming to interview. Different people look at different things. For example, uh, when I go to interview somebody, uh, there are a couple of things I look for. One is uh, communication, because in consulting, you will be communicating a lot with the external world. It's not just, you know, internally in the firm. So it's important that and it doesn't mean that, you know, you should have a US or a UK English accent. That's not what we look for. Uh, but it's all about clarity of ideas. So whether as a, you know, as a person, you're able to communicate clearly or not. Um, second, we look at clarity of ideas, for example. So again, you know, because in consulting, it's often so difficult to judge on technicals, right? So uh, in most of these interviews, you'll find people testing for soft skills. Uh, so they will put you in a scenario, uh, for example, let's say, uh, you know, you were to evaluate the feasibility of a company. How do you go about it? So nobody's looking for a right or a technically right answer. At least I don't look for a technically right answer. But what we look at is clarity of thoughts, that how do you approach it? You know, whether you're able to approach it in a logical manner or not, because uh, you know, in consulting, what we call as the basic philosophy uh, that in order to solve any problem, you know, need to basically break it out, break it down into smaller problems and apply zero principle to solve it. So, so that requires logical thinking. So we look for, you know, if a person has a logical thinking or not. So these are, you know, every, every a long and story, a short story is that every interviewer has its own, uh, you know, has its own metrics or benchmarks against which uh, he or she will test you. Uh, and that's the reason why I said, I mean, don't try to be somebody that you are not. Uh, you have a right company which fits you the best. It may not be a consulting, it may be an iBanking firm, it may be a normal bank, it may be a marketing firm. We don't know. Uh, just try to be yourself and uh, 
who you are will basically win you that job. If you're not fit, uh, then it will show to the interviewer. If not today, then maybe six months down, which is even more difficult. Uh, so I think fitment is something which is very, very uh, individual to the interview who comes. In. But for me, these are some of the aspects that I typically look at. Uh, good communication, confidence, and logical thinking. Anirudh, I hope that uh, answers some of your questions. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. So, shall we move to the second part? And we can then take the Q&A uh, post the climate change bit. Yes, something. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, you know, why is climate change important for India? So sample this that, you know, Mumbai uh, is projected in the next 100 years uh, will be submerged two thirds of, uh, of its land area. Nine out of 10 most polluted cities in the world happen to be in India. Uh, this is by WHO. In fact, there is a daily air indicator, air pollution indicator, which gets reported and you'll always find among top 10, there are several Indian cities which are there. Uh, carbon dioxide levels in India rise at about 5% per annum. Uh, if you compare globally, it stands at about 2.7%. So we are almost, I mean, our growth is roughly twice that of global growth. 70% of water in India is contaminated, according to the United Nations. Uh, so essentially, if you look at the impact of climate change, we can lose 2% of our GDP uh, by 2050. Uh, and probably 10% in the next decade or so, if business is done as per usual. So we need to change this. We are the center of climate change. Um, and you know, all of it goes back to the genesis of environmental impact. And this can be uh, you know, traced back to a very simple formula, I is equal to PCT. This was actually uh, floated by uh, you know, John Holdren and Paul Enrich uh, back in 1974. So what they suggested is, and I basically stands for, uh, for environmental impact, uh, P stands for population, C for consumption, and D for technology. So what they're saying is that in this very uh, you know, simple formula, that if you have a rising population, uh, given an economic growth, and a rising consumption levels, environmental impact would inevitably increase. That is, uh, and if you see for India, all of this is true. We have a growing population, we have growing consumption. If you look at per household, uh, you know, consumption of anything, be it uh, consumption of water, consumption of electricity, consumption of goods, all of it is rising. So unless and until we adopt technology, environment technology, so that's the balancing factor in his eyes, I is equal to PCT, right? So until unless we adopt environmental technology, that has the capability to nullify or even turn around the impact of this rising population and consumption, uh, the impact it has on environment and sustainability levels, we are going to have serious environmental impact in the future. And, you know, the interesting part is that uh, there is data which suggests that uh, technologies such as renewable energy resources, new materials which are environmentally more friendly, uh, industrial and uh, you know, consumer productivity improvements, recycling of waste, all of this are actually technology which are available with us. Uh, it's just that you know, in the corporate decision making, somebody has to decide to adopt these. So, so essentially, we are at the heart of, uh, of climate change. It's not something that we can avoid. Now, uh, just look at this. Now, as I said in the, in the equation of I is equal to PCT, that if we really want to mitigate the impact of climate change, we have to implement climate environmental technology. And the biggest fundamental question which boardroom faces is that if they have to implement climate technology, uh, you know, how do they how do they finance it? Because essentially we need capital to finance it. So that's where green finance comes in. Uh, so green finance is basically a much broad term uh, wherein they talk about, it refers to any financial instrument 
uh, which is invested into a sustainable project. So as far as definition is concerned, it's a very, very uh, simple one. Uh, however, green finance is a much more inclusive term than you think. I mean, the concept of green financing extends beyond simply renewable energy or solar or wind, typically what you hear. And it has additional dimensions to it. For example, energy efficiency, sustainable waste management, sustainable land use, energy efficient buildings, clean transportation, uh, sustainable water management. Um, and you know there are several other climate change adaptation technologies. Uh, so essentially, green finance is a much more inclusive term. So don't just think of it from a perspective of renewable energy. Second, green finance requires support from multiple stakeholders. Now, you would realize that the sectors that I talked about, specifically water and waste management, etc., uh, many of these sectors is where government or public sector enterprises play a predominant role. Hence, you know, both public and private enterprises, uh, both of them have a role in catalyzing green finance. It needs a multi-stakeholder support. Uh, so how did it begin and how did, how did green finance begin? Actually, the green finance idea was initiated from the carbon market instruments. I don't know if uh, any of you have read about it, but they used to be uh, before Paris summit, they used to be something called Kyoto Protocol. So Kyoto Protocol was basically a United Nations uh, uh, declaration where all the countries came together, uh, all the developed and emerging countries. And all these countries basically uh, uh, took upon certain emission norms. So each country said that I will reduce my carbon emission by X million tons. And what it in turn it did was it basically enforced certain carbon emission reduction target on industrialized countries. So essentially UK or US had to achieve certain, their companies in those countries would have to achieve certain reduction in, uh, in carbon. And that's where more energy efficient companies came into play. So for example, if I am a renewable company, uh, I get carbon credit and I can sell that credit to a dirty company. So it became a tradable instrument, just like you have in stock market, right? And many companies actually made a lot of money from this carbon trading instrument. This Kyoto protocol was actually the first global initiative to fund green project. This was the first form of green finance that we see right now. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, there were several challenges in this green trading market. One of the big challenge was that the developed countries felt uh, that these emission targets was basically penalizing them and not the emerging countries like India and China, who are essentially becoming, uh, you know, factories of the world, and uh, you know they are emitting a lot more greenhouse gases than emerge than some of the developed nations. So, um, so it was not a very balanced. Uh, declaration, it wasn't a very balanced target that was given. So that's that was something which uh, which led to basically uh, you know, quota protocol was of course valid for a certain uh, period then it automatically lapsed and the countries could not arrive at a consensus to revive it however you know uh, carbon finance market didn't stop there it actually evolved and now you have more complex green instruments instruments such as green bonds instruments such as green convertible bonds green mezzanine bonds you have green loans uh, from different institutions and banks. In fact, SBI also gives out green loans, by the way, if any of you are interested. Um, and there are funding, uh, you know, which is available from pure green funds. So, so essentially, you know, green, uh, the green finance market has evolved uh, since Quota Protocol. And uh, today it's much, much more complex as we see. So let's uh, shift our focus to India. You know, how much green capital do we need? Uh, so if you look at Government of India has a very special focus on accelerating growth in green infrastructure. It's estimated that a country would need roughly uh, roughly about $2.1 trillion to meet our climate change objectives in the next 10 years. $2.1 trillion. That's almost uh, close to our GDP number, give or take a few basis points. Uh, out of this $2.1 trillion, in clean energy itself, uh, India is, you know, expects to invest roughly about $170 billion. Uh, and additionally, you know, 65 to $70 billion of infrastructure to support this. So that's, you're looking at about 230 to $250 billion there. In clean transportation, things, for example, like metros, railways, etc., we plan to invest roughly about $60 billion. Uh, this is in addition to, of course, $3 billion for construction of these projects. 
and then you have the urban infrastructure projects uh, which like which is like waste management uh, water management which is roughly about 2 to 3 billion dollars so if you look at in total you know we are looking at 2.1 trillion dollars which means every year you need to invest about 200 billion dollars whereas historically how much has india done almost half of it historically if you look at last 10 years we have been investing only 100 billion uh, every year in total infrastructure but this is what our requirements in clean infrastructure is so how how do we finance it so essentially if you look at uh, historically about 65 to 70% of our uh, of our money used to come from banks so banks used to fund 65 to 70% about 20 to 22 percent was funded by capital markets, which was in form of bonds, and roughly about uh, you know the rest 10 to 12 percent was from external borrowings. Uh, but today our demand vastly outstrips the supply, uh, and that also by a very la large margin. So I just told you that's about our requirement is about 2x of what we can actually finance. So we do need uh, you know green financing to uh, to basically meta energy uh, to meta infrastructure requirements so this brings us uh, you know uh, to the point of basically green financing or green bond specifically which is a much more matured instrument within green finance now if you look at uh, this is not something which is uh, you know which is new to india uh, there have been several companies specifically renewable energy companies likes of Azure, NTPC, Green Core, Renew Power, these are some of the largest Indian renewable companies, um, including some of the banks, for example, Yes Bank, Exim, uh, Access Bank, SBI. All of these uh, people have raised green bonds from international as well as domestic market. Now, the idea of green bonds is that very simple. Essentially, you go to a set of investors, you tell them that the capital I'm raising is for investment in specific assets. And uh, all you have is that you have an obligation that these money that you collect from the said investors cannot be invested on anything else. It has to be invested in green assets. So that's the entire genesis of, uh, of, green, uh, of green bonds, basically. Now, uh, so, so what I was saying is that a lot of companies in India have already done that. Uh, but there's, there are several challenges which exist in this green bond market, especially in India. One is that if you look at uh, who are issuing green bonds, it has been largely the renewable energy companies, which I was uh, which I was talking about. Only a small fraction, maybe about 17, 15 to 17 percent, actually goes towards uh, transport, clean transport, um, uh, and the rest, you know, 60 to 70 percent actually goes towards energy. In comparison, if you look at globally, these are much more balanced. So you have a large portion, about 30, 40 percent, going towards transport. You have a large portion which goes towards urban projects, uh, and then you have, of course, the normal renewable energy assets. So uh, all I'm saying is that we are too much concentrated into a single sector, whereas the other sectors are suffering. Uh, the second biggest issue we fail, face in green bonds is that in India, price is a very important key point. So, I mean, I don't know how much, how many of you remember uh, the entire political issue about uh, electricity prices in Delhi. Uh, so all of this, uh, you know, uh, adds to pressure of raising low-cost funds uh, for Indian companies. So Indian companies are always uh, under pressure to raise low-cost low funds. Now, green bonds, three years back, uh, they were almost 2.5 to 3 percent cheaper uh, than domestic interest rates. But over the last few years, uh, government of India has actually brought down the uh, domestic interest rates. So today, including cost of hedging, which is roughly about six to seven percent, quite high for India, uh, green bonds today don't make financial sense. Uh, so something needs to be done to address this so that the prices of green bonds can come down. So that's the second challenge that we have. Uh, so let's look at what are the key challenges uh, for, good, for a green finance market in India. Uh, first is low investor base. So primarily, if you look at uh, the investor base for green finance market in India, these are few institutional investors, you know, some people like LIC or an SPI, uh, who at a corporate level have decided or they have been forced to decide by the government that they will invest in renewable or green projects. 
um, and some of them are funded by development institutions like World Bank, ADB, so they tend to invest in green infrastructure. Uh, but overall, if you see, there is a very, uh, there's quite lack of knowledge and understanding of green finance as an asset class, especially among retail investors. I mean, how many of people in this room would know that green, uh, green bonds is actually a viable instrument today for somebody to invest? Second is that if you look at the bond market as a whole, it has a substantial government bond. Uh, the challenge for a country like India is that in every sector or every avenue that you go, you will find government as a big player. Now, what happens? What happens is that if I am an investor and I have 100 rupees to invest, I have two choices. I have a corporate who is offering a green bond at, let's say, 8%, and I have government who is offering uh, a bond at 6%. Now, as an investor, I'll prefer government to a large extent because 6% is a high number, and government has doesn't have a default risk. I have no risk investing in a government security. So if you have too much government securities playing in the market, it will often distort investor preference. So, so that's the second issue in Indian markets. Third, uh, there are very limited instruments and products. And again, I think this goes back to entirely to the awareness issue uh, because investors issuers are so less aware you have very limited instruments uh, which are there uh, in the market. And because these are limited instruments and the investor base is low, uh, the markets tend to be more illiquid, right? So you don't have liquidity uh, in the market. And that's often a detriment for you. Uh, next, a few points, for example, we don't have adequate infrastructure in markets, such as, uh, you know, screen-based automated auto matching, uh, central clearing, et cetera, for green, uh, for green instruments now. Not going to talk too much about it. I think these are more technicalities you can leave it. Uh, but uh, long story short, I think there is also some need to invest in market infrastructure if we want to have a vibrant uh, green instrument market. Uh, finally, and you know there are some other issues, but more importantly, I think we require a rating system, a rating system which can not only tells us uh, today, for example, the rating system only tells us that. Uh, whether this corporate borrower, uh, you know, uh, how how good uh, a ch or how bad a chance do they have to default? So if he's a triple A rating, that means he is he has extremely low chance of defaulting. If he has, uh, let's say, a D rating, then there's a good chance he might default. So I think in addition to that, if we are really looking at, uh, you know, encouraging green uh, issuances, then we also need to have a rating system, which can also give a rating to how much green factor that this bond has. And, you know, that can have a psychological impact for investors when they are choosing. So these are some of the challenges which, uh, which you find in, uh, in India. So, you know, what do I do? I mean, there are several uh, recommendations. I won't talk about them. But I think the most important one is generating awareness. Uh, people such as yourselves who are, you know, who are passing from B schools who are going to be there at the helm of corporate. Many of you will join investment banks, uh, hedge funds, etc. You need to be aware uh, that there is a green, uh, you know, there is a green finance market. It offers uh, exactly similar returns as what a conventional market for would be. Uh, but these are the instruments where you can contribute positively to climate change. Um, second uh, is having financial and tax incentives. So it's important to attract investors. Government could actually have uh, more conducive financial and tax incentives offered. They do actually offer. So I'm saying that this is already there. For example, you'll find that, uh, just to give an example, last year budget uh, finance minister declared that if you are buying an uh, electric vehicle, right? you get certain incentives, certain tax incentives, certain tax deductions. So all of these can actually add on to the uh, different financial and tax incentives. And that's very crucial to attract uh, investors very quickly. And finally, we need to have credit guarantees for green infrastructure project. Now, why do I say this? Because uh, we were just talking about the fact that, uh, uh, you know, uh, if there is a choice uh, between, uh, uh, between a AAA rated uh, conventional product versus a double A rated green product, people will choose triple A and the pricing is same. So our effort should go, how can we enhance those gar the credit uh, profile of the double A rated to bring it to triple A rated so that people can have a better choice. And in this role, again, government can play a big role as an enabler in providing or enabling some of this credit uh, market. In fact, there are several companies who do that. 
uh, some of the multilateral companies such as ADB, uh, IFC uh, offer such uh, credit guarantees. Uh, and then there are more specialized companies such as Garantco, uh, which offers uh, you know, similar credit guarantees. So we need a very vibrant credit guarantee market. And I think finally, you know, uh, who has the largest bucks? Uh, it's the large pension funds, the globally large pension funds, globally large money managers, uh, insurance funds. And we have to ensure, we have to make policies which can ensure that some of these pension funds and sovereign funds actually come and invest in Indian green finance market. To give you a precursor, this is already happening. Uh, so for example, Government of India today has a preferential mechanism for sovereign funds to come and invest in India. Uh, so some of these are already happening, uh, but yes, it needs a continuous push uh, to, to see it to fruition. And finally, uh, so this is the last slide that I have on green finance. In all of these, uh, specifically in a country such as ours, government can play a substantial role in its labor. What can they do? Uh, essentially, there are three ways in which it can play a substantial role. One is revenue support. Uh, policies. So essentially, revenue support policies is very simple. They say that if you're setting up a green asset, and if you're not recovering adequate revenue from the market, uh, because you have invested in green rather than investing in gray, uh, we will give you certain support, uh, certain monetary support to bring up your revenue. So that's revenue support policy. Uh, second avenue is uh, basically having tools uh, to reduce green energy financing cost. And that's where guarantees come into play. Uh, so we can offer pub, you know, credit guarantees to companies who are raising green finance. Or we can give subs concessional loans, grants, and subs uh, you know, from the existing government back. So some of these, some of these tools can be used to reduce the cost of financing, which is so critical as we discussed previously. And finally, we can have fiscal policies which supports green investments. Now, this can be in form of, you know, tax credit, additional depreciation, tax savings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this is another way in which we can attract investors very quickly. So this brings us to the end of uh, this short discussion around climate change and green finance specifically. Uh, you know, just before leaving, uh, what I would like to mention is that it's, it's very good to be green, but it's not easy. Um, and specifically as a country, when we are going into the green finance value change, uh, changing the way that our products are packaged and delivered, uh, we need to abandon our long-term uh, policies of investing in green. And we have to move towards green in longer run, specifically if you want to protect our generations and protect our cities. Uh, and more importantly, we tend to avoid, we have to avoid the temptation of greenwash. So greenwash is something that you will face a lot when you move to corporate world. Um, because if there is a requirement by government or requirement by a shareholders to show that you are uh, committed towards green, what people tend to do is uh, instead of directly investing into something sustainable, they will try to wash it down. So they will say, for example, that if I'm setting up a coal plant, this is more energy efficient coal plant, but there is nothing like an energy efficient coal plant. All coal plant uh, gives out emissions. So these are what we call as green washing. And as we move out to the corporate world, we need to avoid the temptation for green washing. Um, so, so with this, I think uh, I would like to conclude a session on uh, climate change. I think we are taught, uh, we have half an hour from here uh, for the Q&A session. So, so uh, you talked about uh, green technologies uh, not being very uh, you know easy to apply and even the finances are really tough to get that's a very important aspect and requires a lot of regulatory help uh, but the also uh, the problem also lies within the technology right there are very few technologies which are actually uh, you uh, means able to capture the carbon they are just being carbon neutral and carbon positive is really tough to achieve any thoughts on that right so uh, have so see i think 
uh, you're right in a way that specifically, I think the innovations around environment technology have not kept pace uh, with the way that at least we would have anticipated. Uh, but I think part of it also goes back to amount of investments that are being made uh, to research these technologies. So how many, for example, I mean, some, many of you guys would have come from uh, very coverted engineering institutions. How many engineering institutions do we have a dedicated research going into environmental uh, technologies? I mean, few, few professors uh, take up on their own will. But the long story short is that, uh, you know, when we move to corporate world, we would realize that companies uh, tend to look very short term often. And that's where uh, people like us have our jobs, like in consulting. Uh, and because of the short term uh, outlook of uh, management and corporates, uh, they would take decisions uh, which are uh, which may not be exactly conducive. So for example, if there is a choice to investing into a environment technology which can be a fruit in the next five years vis-a-vis -vis investing in something which is off the shelf available in market, uh, ninety percent of people will choose off the shelf product. So uh, I do agree that uh, technology. Uh, isn't there for specifically more advanced things like carbon capture, etc. Uh, but if you draw parallels with uh, the way that solar technology has evolved, and I, this is the best example of uh, investment and technology evolution if we can look at. So solar today uh, is actually cheaper in India. It's cheaper than coal, right? So coal is roughly about four to five cents in terms of cost. Uh, solar would be roughly about two to three cents. So solar technology, in fact, has become cheaper than uh, than conventional. Now, how it become cheaper is because in India, government made a massive push towards renewable technologies. They gave out uh, tenders of, you know, 10, 15 gigawatt. Each of these tenders is roughly like a 10, 20 billion dollar tenders. It, pr it provided preferential pricing to begin with. It provided tax incentives to start with. So in 2010, 11, if you're investing in solar, many, uh, many high net worth individuals also started investing in uh, renewable. The reason is that they got tax incentives for that. So that, that's how government actually pushed some of these evolutions. Uh, and then because government pushed through these evolutions and made market open for larger opportunities, the corporate saw that there is an opportunity to invest and they started investing. But even in that, if you see specifically in India, right, we have missed a bus because while we have invested in building a lot of renewable, uh, but we don't own technology because none of the corporates were uh, forward looking to invest in technology 10 years back. Chinese did that, US did that, uh, Europe did that, but we missed the bus. Uh, even though just to give you a flavor, we actually invested in renewable uh, about 40, 50 years back. In 1970, we actually started investing in renewable. That was far, that was at least 20 years before China, uh, but you know, we got left behind. Developing countries are expected to use uh, more of the conventional energy, right? That's how uh, US and maybe even other com other countries have uh, improved or developed. Uh, and the convention also dictates that, uh, means of what I understand, it is about capturing the excess carbon that we are emitting. Uh, I'm right. Am I right? Yeah. So, uh, so look, I think uh, if you it's a choice, right? So today I do have technologies which can completely replace conventional. Uh, I have storage technologies. I, I do agree storage technologies are expensive, uh, but again, going by similar Moose law, you can expect that this technology will become affordable in the next three to four years. So it's a choice that whether, uh, and you know, always as I think that was the initial problems with Kyoto Protocol also, because we were thinking that others should do it. Others should do it and they should, you know, they will probably, but it is what we can also do. We are not a small nation. We are a huge nation. We are a growing nation. And I, you know, the first point which I was describing on the, on the presentation, the formula on I is equal to PCT. You know, we are a country where a population is growing, consumption is growing which implies that we are actually putting a lot more stress on the environment today. So it is, I think, not only the responsibility of emerging countries, but uh, developed countries, but also the emerging countries to share the load. Uh, and that's how I think we be able to mitigate. Now, 
to answer your question, does it, I mean, so how do we manage it? Because uh, we may not have resources and that's I think where, uh, you know, alliances and international forums come into play. I think the, uh, what emerging countries such as India have been asking from the West is access to technology uh, at uh, a cheaper cost. Um, so, you know, A, access to technology, B, access to uh, funds from their countries, uh, their investors. Um, so some of these avenues can actually help uh, us become more self-reliant uh, in terms of implementing some of these uh, technologies. So uh, can we, you know, today migrate 100% out of coal? No, we can't because 80% of our generation still comes from that. Uh, but it's definitely a gradual process that we need to start working today rather than tomorrow to achieve something like that in the next two to three decades. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. We actually generally get away by saying that the emission per person in our countries, these developing countries are very less, but the volumes are actually very high in terms of absolute numbers. So that is a big problem uh, these developing countries do need to address. Uh, but uh, even the corporates, like uh, even Amazon and uh, other companies, uh, Bill Gates does invest in many of the green technologies, like even carbon engineering and many other companies. But uh, there are very few companies who are actually talking about, uh, you know, they are financing, but they are not capturing the uh, carbon. They are just working on the, uh, uh, the regulate, filling the regulatory aspects rather than having any kind of profit motive with it. That is true. And, uh, you know, uh, and this is true specifically for emerging countries, uh, such as India and China, who are today probably the two biggest greenhouse emitters also, along with the developed world, of course. Uh, and there's a reason to that. Um, and I don't know how, much, how many of you have heard about Mr. Khosla, who happens to be, uh, you know, one of the management gurus, uh, so he once said that India and China um, are countries which require black swan solutions. Uh, they can't do with normal solutions, normal, um, you know, greenwashing solutions. So what essentially he meant was that not in these countries to succeed, not only do you need uh, green technologies, but you need green technologies which are affordable, which are very, very, very affordable because these countries are very price conscious. Uh, because, I mean, part of it also goes towards per capita income, whether the majority of us can afford uh, that kind of migration or not. So, so essentially, to answer your question, uh, uh, all of these things are not happening uh, because there are certain economic and social factors which are driving it down. Uh, and, you know, economic and social factors are not there, not just there at uh, at a person level, uh, but it also happens to be there at the corporate level. Just to give you a genesis, you know, I was talking to one of my friends. Uh, uh, in 2012, he happened to ma uh, make something called solar heating system. Uh, he was an engineer. He manufactured something like that, and he floated. Uh, he actually implemented in a lot of vendors, etc. Uh, but it never found commercial success because of the initial cost of uh, funds. It's not something that many of us can't afford, but then we make a choice, right? Do I spend five lakhs on putting up a solar system on the top of my house or not? So companies very similarly, uh, they face ongoing questions about investments that are made, right? So essentially, uh, yes, they, and I think the good part is that uh, globally, shareholders, investors are asking companies to become more climate conscious. And that's the reason why you find that the Amazons and the Flipkarts of the world are actually investing uh, in uh, in some sort of, I mean, whether it be renewable, whether it be, uh, you know, uh, uh, changing their processes, looking at e-mobility, etc. In different, in their different ways, they're trying to reduce the carbon footprint. Uh, what you're talking about in terms of uh, you know, carbon capture or reducing the current carbon footprint, uh, that would re require actually substantial overhaul of the current systems, processes, machines, etc. Now, that's not a uh, cheap job. That's an extremely, extremely investment incentive job. I mean, it will not happen um, like a big bang in a day. It will take time to happen. So we need to be patient with some of these companies. And I think 
so see, uh, I have seen, if you look at globally at the world, today there are about 25% funds whose LPs have told them that you do not invest in anything that is green. You only invest in green uh, investments or green companies. So what we are seeing is that in the last decade, and this has become 20, 23, 25, this will become 50 and then it will become 100. So when once we start stop funding gray technologies, um, automatically we'll see that transition. But the idea is that the intent and the journey has to start. Uh, and uh, you know, once we enter in the corporate world, we'll face with similar decisions. It's important that we know about it and uh, we decide on, uh, on taking the right path from there. Thank you, sir. I got a lot of perspective from Thank you, Krishna. A question to you, Sandeep. Um, so what would yes, be your, your advice to people like B-School students who are graduating? Um, how do they get a head start in, in this area of sustainability? Because uh, I guess you and I both know that sustainability is also, also faces a lot of resistance. Companies are not making to, willing to make that shift to sustainability. And in B-School, you're also taught to how do you make profits, how do you generate revenues? And this is something which is a, like a paradigm shift which are making the clients do. So how do you suggest that students like us get a head start in, in engaging in sustainability initiatives? Yeah. So Namrata, I think uh, as far as head start is concerned, it, it all begins with staying informed. Um, I, I, I mean, I have probably not work, walked into a classroom for since last 10 years after I left the school, but uh, during our days, of course, we had uh, limited avenues of uh, of information, etc. We did have Wiki at that point in time also. Uh, the idea is to stay informed. I mean, how do you become a responsible citizen, investor, or employee? It's, it's by staying informed. Uh, it's important to know what is happening in the world, uh, in the world of sustainability, in the world of climate change. Uh, you will find a lot of people dismissing it, that it's, you know, for example, Mr. Trump uh, dismissed it that, you know, the climate change is a fake, you know, fake invention by Democrats and so on and so forth. But, but the idea is that it's a real threat. Um, it's important to learn about it. It's important to understand it. Uh, because only by staying informed uh, can you change uh, decisions, can you influence people, um, you can make people aware uh, uh, you can change their minds when you join corporate world. So I think where does it start and where does it end? It all starts with staying informed. Uh, so that's, I think, point number one. Uh, point number two, I think, how do you influence decisions when you go to corporates? Because, you know, corporates, uh, it's all about money making. Actually, that's something which... Uh, which is not true. And, uh, you know, if you gradually look at today, people who are investing in green uh, are doing far better than people who have stayed green. Uh, because A, it, uh, I mean, not, uh, not that uh, it just influences the perception of investors and in stock markets and, you know, not only that, uh, but also in long run, uh, environment friendly technologies can actually give you far better return on investment than a great technology. So it is all about convincing your bosses, your managers uh, that there's a choice to make and in long run the more environment friendly uh, choice is going to be even the most profitable choice. So just to give you an example, uh, look at the stock market prices, uh, the, you know, like the price to book ratio. Uh, for a conventional company versus a renewable company on the stock market. Just do that today. I mean, go look at Adani green prices uh, versus uh, any conventional company like a, and, uh, and see the difference, uh, how they are valued. Thank you, Sandeep. Thanks, uh, Mr. Sandeep, Nitesh here. Hi, Nitesh. Hi. Uh, so I had a question. Uh, so animal husbandry is a major contributor to the global carbon footprint. However, we never hear about it. I mean, that is one thing that uh, I don't think, uh, I mean, people are being made, av made aware about simply mm -hmm. for the factor of uh, inconvenience to the people. People don't want to accept it, right? Whenever you think of global warming, the first image that pops up into your head is transportation or uh, power plants, right? This is 
still like it contributes to 20% of the carb global carbon footprint however there is no talk about it uh there was also talk about uh, research going into cultured meat right uh, lab grown meat but uh, i mean uh, there's no research similar to that in india right i mean for a country who is trying to you know you see so many uh, riots and all just for animal meat and all that but there is absolutely no research being done in this right i mean so it's not that uh, research is not being done uh, if you go to uh, ministry of new renewable and technology mnre right so you will find that they are talking about uh, different biomass technologies uh, there have been research done there are several incentives which are being offered um and it's not that even globally we are not talking about it because uh, you know look at some of the uh, specifically look at nordic countries they have done quite a bit in terms of uh, you know promoting better practices so when people are not going to change their eating habits overnight right so that's not going to happen but at least we can be more uh, responsible towards it we can have better technologies we can have better disposal systems right uh, and i think that's where uh, some of these nordic countries have done exceptionally well um, so it's not that over the world nobody is doing it they are doing it uh, i think in india uh, it's largely not been too successful because of the structure of the industry here so if you look at uh, you know invest animal husbandry is a more organized industry right so you have large companies billion dollar companies million dollar companies are managing it yeah so you know how to address that uh, and companies can i mean it's difficult for them to also shift but once they decide to shift then it can happen very quickly yeah um in india however this is a very very unorganized sector yeah you know, it's a fragmented it's a, yeah it's a very fragmented sector and uh then just like you know uh, all this commotion around farm bills etc there are a lot of stakeholders who have different interests here a lot of people who are um, who are who may not be just to give you an example right waste to energy project have not been very successful in india yeah. one of the primary reasons is that people who collect waste there is a huge uh, they are they are a huge organized strength and they would deter um, any such investment which is made by corporate sector so similarly in animal husbandry also there is a there are huge lobbies there are huge middlemen uh, who have different interests and they they have stopped such large scale implementation also for the fact that because in india uh, often the uh, the people who are involved in the profession they are not rich they are very uh, they are poor the below Uh, they are either not i wouldn't say below poverty line but they can't afford some of these uh, more efficient practices i mean a they are not aware and b they cannot afford in compare i mean just compare of a meat farmer of india versus a meat farmer from europe or australia they they have the financial capital to do something which is more environment friendly these guys many of them cannot so i think is also the industry the industry structure which is uh, Uh, which actually in india which uh, which holds any such innovation happening yeah. uh, government has made uh, has taken steps in past and you know all of us hope that uh, even this at this front it moves forward yeah because of the democracy i i guess sir. all the lobbying um, i mean look so i mean lobbying is there everywhere uh, yeah. if i am you know if i make pencils then i will uh, i will ask uh, you know firms to promote pencils i'll always promote pencils everywhere and i would not like anybody promoting pens even though it might be a more efficient product so True. so corporate interest will always be there uh, sure sir thank you sandesh hi sandeep gorav here hi gorav Yeah, actually, I have a question. Like, uh, we have seen recently that Joe Biden, Biden has like he has said for three trillion dollar for decarbonizing the economy. Despite that, there is a deep concern that the China, which is leading in the you know the sustainable and the green energy by seventy two percent of world solar module manufacturing, sixty nine percent of the lithium ion, and most of the mineral refining of this cobalt and lithium. so will it be like a creation of 
electro state same as in the line of petro state and how does the geopolitics of this will play out for the invest investment in the developing countries so look i mean uh, i'm not a political expert to comment on that but certainly uh, from a pure business point of view uh, what china has done tremendously good for themselves and bad for other countries yes. yourselves is that it has shifted supply chains it has shifted price curves uh, to for its own benefit right so when i say supply chains essentially uh, and they they have done it through different means uh, so yeah. they not go or diverge into that uh, but essentially what they have ensured is that countries including us uh, are dependent on china uh, for meeting its uh, critical energy needs the supply mm -hmm. needs so china is core to supply chain of the world today right it's the world's factory today so it's core to any supply chain that you'll find uh, so to that extent you know it is an important factor uh, how does it you know if let's say something uh, if something breaks out between us and china how does it influence uh, that i think is a little overstated because in this entire relationship china is actually at a much is at, actually at the beneficial end you know, so because the and us are buying its product chinese industries are thriving right, so the sure. side to shift i think the world is today so quick that you will find other countries leaping at that opportunities i mean just to give you an example vietnam i mean if any one of you get some time read about their transition from a uh, from a completely shut down communist country to becoming more open economy today right, sure. the us investors are in fact preferring to go and establish manufacturing footprint in vietnam so uh, so what i'm saying is that to, at, in this equation china is at the beneficial end if there is a disruption in supply chain um, then they would also be at the receiving end so regarding the concentration of power like if as we have seen in the middle east for the oil oil age and all those stuff how does uh, you know the opec it used to have an hegemony over the so same yeah. can happen with the china regarding the green energy not so much because you know un, the problem with petro comparing petro with uh, with other uh, you know commodities of interest today be it uh, storage or be it even data right so these are very easily flowable between country to country so for example uh, you don't need china to be the sole manufacturer of modules even india can become module manufacturer uh, and so does you know because lithium ion uh, or basically lithium uh, you talked about lithium mining right so lithium yes. spread all across the world there is uh, there are huge concentration in africa there is huge concentration in places like afghanistan for example so all i'm saying is that china here Uh, today it plays a role where it is bringing all of this together and manufacturing it for its own benefit uh, but this technology is there with other countries as well there are indian for example there are indian manufacturers uh, who have technology for module manufacturing right so they don't need necessarily and in fact just to give you an idea that all of this china uh, technology that we talk about is actually german technology german solar technology which have been taken from german firms sure um and they have been adopted most of the equipment that are used for manufacturing these modules are all german modules german, uh, german uh, machines so essentially i'm saying that even in this supply chain is unlike the petro supply chain where because it's a physical asset right so it's based and concentrated in a country you, you have no way to take it away uh, even with that you know look at what us did uh, with uh, shell gas discovery right so to this sir uh gas and petrol prices coming down because us is today independent and uh, they used to be one of the largest procurers so essentially you can even disrupt that kind of deep um physical resource uh, you know a differentiation so uh, as far as manufacturing is concerned i don't think that it is uh, it is so sticky that you can, can't change the situation um and move away from china and create separate uh, in fact at some point i think india missed the bus because uh, maybe our government didn't have the policies and also our investors in india didn't have that foresight sure sure 
in the place. But otherwise, I think other countries are already doing it. As I was saying, Vietnam, Malaysia, they're already replacing uh, China as far as uh, module. And again, on lithium ion, etc. Again, very, very nascent stage and other countries can quickly replace them. Government of India is running a 50 megawatt hour, uh, 50 gigawatt hour uh, battery manufacturing facility tender, uh, which will, Niti Aayog is running that. It will come up very soon. So there are companies like Panasonic and Samsung who essentially hold uh, uh, technologies can uh, can come and participate. Right? Mm -hmm. so, so to that extent, I think it, it's not as bad as you think. Yeah, thank you. Sir. Hey, hi, Samsung. Hey, Pankar here. Yeah, go ahead. the Pankar. Yeah, 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 yeah the Pankar. Order. You can go ahead. So, Sandeep, uh, recently a report came out wherein uh, uh, we saw that um, World Bank, since the Paris Accord, has financed about $12 billion in coal-powered coal uh, facilities. And uh, since 2015 to 2019, it has invested around $9.5 billion in renewable energy sector. So, my question is, why the this kind of you know policy dichotomy that these uh, in, international development finance institutions are having? Uh, do you think that this is some kind of policy pa paralysis that is there because you know U.S. Uh, itself as one of the hegemonic powers in the world has uh, uh, rescued itself from the Paris uh, Accord? So that uh, that uh, that is. Uh, in some way having uh, impact on their policy decisions that the DFIs are having uh, nowadays. Okay, so Dipankar, I think uh, what happens is that often we are very biased with what the media reports and we often don't get to see the full picture of, of how it's happening. Now to answer your question, India, uh, US walking out of Paris Accord. See, these accords are what? They are a way, it's, it's a basically a stick principle. So essentially, you are asking countries that, you know, you have to do this. You have to reduce emissions. So that's a stick principle. But if you look at which are the companies today who are investing largest amount in reducing carbon footprint, it is essentially the same U.S. companies. The same Google, the same Amazon we are talking about are actually investing billions uh, in renewable technology to reduce their carbon footprint. How many companies from China are doing it? None, but we don't hear about it. Uh, you know, because it's more, I guess, uh, popular to talk about US companies. So yes, them walking out my, is a temporary setback, but I don't really think that, uh, that it's that big a setback because if corporates start being responsible, if individuals such as us start being responsible, how much emission do you think government emits uh, in this world? I mean, in US, government doesn't control anything, right? So uh, most of the investments are controlled by private sector. So they don't, uh, so they don't, uh, they're not big carbon emitters per se. So let corporates be responsible, let there be better awareness, let shareholders come up and say that we need green technology. So I think that's part of it. Second, coming back to the question about World Bank, uh, I don't know which report we are referring to and whether World Bank has invested more on conventional. At times, I mean, there are two things. One is that people have a different way of reporting what a conventional technology is. For example, if World Bank is investing, World Bank invests a lot, of, lot on TND sector, which is basically the grid, right, on the network. So uh, people might tend to say that, look, this grid means it's conventional, but it's not. But even if they are, I can understand the situation. So, for example, if you go down to Africa, like, like, so let's consider a country like Liberia. Do you know what the installed capacity of Liberia was? It was less than 100 megawatt. Uh, I mean, a small area within Mumbai consumes more energy than the total installed capacity of that country. So there, people actually literally live in town. So it's a choice between installing an energy source versus carbon, I think uh, it's emitting the energy need then becomes the basic, uh, you know, criteria there. Uh, but having said that, um, a lot of investments are actually even happening, even at that level, uh, to promote renewable energy, for example, giving solar cooking equipment, off-grid systems, etc., which is happening. So, look, the idea is that we'll always have to balance. It's good to say that we will invest, we should always invest in clean. And in fact, that's what 
um, I've also been trying to say, but uh, you will be faced with choices. Uh, and at times you would have to go with, there will be times where you have to go with choice, which uh, may not seem appropriate for outsiders, but because you have better information, uh, you're making that choice. But uh, look, long story short, what I'm trying to tell you is that institutions such as World Bank and IFC and ADB, they have great imp And because uh, I have actually been also part of, uh, of the system at times, so I know that there is a very, very conscious push uh, towards moving towards green. Uh, so it would be wrong to say that, you know, uh, because of some report that they are not. We don't have all information to suggest that. Um, so let's not be so pessimistic, you know. Uh, I think if individually each one of us can do something, then we'll have a better world to live in. Yeah, you got it. Yes. So I have a question, Sandeep. In yeah. the green financial ecosystem, mm -hmm. one of the main pain points for the power producer is the cash flows from discoms, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we have also seen that uh, this government has given a one time package of 80000 crores because of this 90000 uh, this 90000 crores to this this council because they they were stressed so what is your take means what uh, disruptive changes are needed in this area so that uh, the whole ecosystem stabilizes you know why the discoms don't have money uh, <laughs> because we don't pay them on time right right so that's so that think... was my question yeah, so I think long story short, uh, see, that is that is a problem in India, and it has been for quite some time. Uh, several reasons for bad discount financial health. Uh, one of it is, of course, consumer behavior in various parts of the country. Uh, I mean, again, India is, as people say, it's actually a collection of 26, 27 countries rather than, you know, one single nation, right? So individual behavior are very different. You go to Gujarat, uh, people pay on time. You go to some other part of the country, uh, they don't. So so I think that's uh, one of the issue. What really helps is to have enforcement. And that's, I think, a government job to have police and courts set up who actually enforce uh, that if, if, the, if there is a theft being by, done by somebody, it's as good as you know stealing something, right? If you're not paying, it's as good as stealing something, then that person should be punished. Um, so to that extent, I think enforcement is a key issue uh, through which we can address it. Uh, and that is quite uh, low in India, partly because of, partly because electricity becomes a very, very important political issue often. So many a times people don't want to interfere into that. And discounts is where you interact with customers directly. So that's point one. Point two, I think this government has done a lot of work uh, to improve or change the scenario. Uh, what you heard about is the uh, is basically the 90,000 crore liquidity investment, which was done by uh, by government, but that was primarily to deal with COVID uh, liquidity issues, right? So it was it's not a grant; it's a loan, uh, which is backed by state government government guarantees. And uh, the idea is that uh, because collections were quite low during the collection period, uh, during this uh, COVID lockdown period, so this is basically to mm, meet you know, your liabilities which have been compounding. Uh, but there are several things that government have done, and I can talk about some of them. For example, in August 2019, uh, the energy minister declared that every distribution company has to put up payment security in form of letter of credit with generating companies. So essentially, this is an LC, which is basically if, if I'm not paying within 30 days, then the generating company can liquidate the LCs and take money from the bank. So, um, so all, you know, uh, all companies were asked to do that. So you would actually see, see that from August 19 to February 20, um, distribution companies started paying on time because they were forced to do that. So, uh, so that was one change which government did. They are planning to bring a very similar change in the electricity bill amendment to 2020. So in that amendment, they are basically saying that payment security will become mandatory uh, on all distribution companies. Essentially, you have to have a payment security mechanism. So this will ensure that timely payments happen. Uh, and before that, in fact, government launched a program which was called Uday, uh, where Uday was the, like a one-time financial restructuring exercise 
where they cleaned up the existing liabilities. Uh, the, the DISCOM liabilities were taken up partly by state government and partly they were financed by central government. So this government has done quite a bit uh, for improving, but DISCOM improvement is a longer journey than we think because it's a combination of uh, you know, some of these financial interventions and operational improvement uh, enforcement, uh, which I was talking about, and that takes time. So. Uh, but hopefully, it uh, you know uh, at least the process is, has kicks, been kickstarted by the government. So Sandeep, since Thank we you. are at the fag end of the session, so we can take one more question before we wrap up. So guys, anything sure. else from your end? Rajit, can I go ahead? I have one more question. Yes, Deepankar, please go ahead. So Sandeep, uh, uh, India is part of ISA, right? The International Solar Alliance. Uh, can you uh, uh, enlighten us on how that alliance is helping India grow the uh, our homegrown supply chain of you know solar panels and stuff like that? Because uh, that is one of the pain areas that we currently have, as uh, previously pointed out by my fellow batchmates regarding the uh, supply side uh, supply chain that China actually has uh, his money over. So can you just enlighten us how that is helping uh, us, you know, getting a foothold on the supply chain side? Right. So by this, I think you guys are really pissed off on China. Huh? So, uh, so look, I think these are two different questions. One is uh, ISA as an organization. ISA in this organization has been there for quite some time. For most people who don't know, this is what this is called. Uh, in the Solar Alliance, which was basically set, it's a, it's a multi-country effort, ideally, just like United Nations, but it was basically, it began with uh, India taking the leadership role. In fact, uh, the key offices are based in Delhi and uh, the leadership positions in, in ISA has been with, uh, with India only. Uh, but, you know, let me not go down, uh, see, uh, they in, what ISA have been trying to do is that it has been trying to look at projects in several, several underdeveloped countries like from Africa, et cetera, uh, raise finances for those projects and get those implemented. So uh, to be honest, ISA's role today has been very limited. It has been limited to the amount of funds that they have. And the funds have been quite low, partly because in ISA, in ISA other than France, uh, just give me one second, my charge is trying out. Yeah, in ISA, other than France, none of the other large uh, developed nations are a part of uh, this alliance. Uh, and, you know, in, in world today, in any multilateral organization to survive, they need capital. And this capital typically comes from donor countries. And who are the large donor countries today? They are the West, right? So US, UK, uh, Europe, uh, Germany, for example, through GIZ, et cetera. So they are the largest donors in the world. In ISA, only France has been one of uh, the active donor in past among the developed countries. So the amount of capital which is available for ISA is not substantial today, uh, although they are uh, trying to raise uh, a substantial fund to invest into these uh, solar projects that they've identified. So that is, I think, one from an activity perspective. While they have tried to do a lot, it has not been, uh, they have not been quite active. The second aspect which you were talking about is in terms of supply chain. Um, I think there's a need to look at both of these separately. The Government of India has done some, has taken some steps towards supply chain. Uh, one is that they floated a large, uh, large opportunity, which said that if you if you have solar module manufacturing, which is based out of India. Um, I will give you four times of that quantity. So if you have one gigawatt of solar production, I will give you four gigawatts of uh, solar PPS as a certain tariff. So this was an opportunity where two companies won. Uh, it was a process and there were two companies who won. Uh, overall, I think 10 to 12 gigawatts were awarded out, which is huge number, by the way. And the two companies were Adani and Azure. Uh, both renewable companies. Uh, second, what government has done is it has made mandatory that all public sector procurement has to be uh, domestic products. So essentially, if you are, uh, if you are, let's say, 
you know, uh, if 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 you are one of the uh, domestic banks, and if you are if you are wishing to install solar panels on your rooftop, it has to be domestic panel. That's number two. Number three is what they have done is they floated this large program called Kusum Scheme. Uh, I don't know how many of you are aware, but it's a it's a fairly large uh, decentralized energy program, uh, which is to help farmers basically, and it's a very very big program. I think it's the size of 10, 12 gigawatts to begin with, and the procurement under Kusum will come uh, largely from domestic products. So essentially, because of this, if you see, in the last five to six years, uh, today our module manufacturing capacity is not low. By the way, we are we have about 11 gigawatts of module manufacturing capacity, and about six gigawatts of cell manufacturing capacity. So cell is just you know the step previous to modules basically. So essentially, uh, you know these are some of the steps which our government has taken for uh, domestic uh, manufacturing. But again, you know it all comes down to the fact of pricing again because. Uh, module prices impact solar prices which in turn impact prices that are charged to discounts which in turn impacts prices that you and i pay for our households right and uh, while government can always take a decision to stop imports but it has an impact on prices because indian products are more expensive than the chinese ones specifically and uh, so so they basically try to balance it out you know can we domestically manufacture all our needs? Yes, we can, but it would have impact on prices, which government often has to balance between both of those. So, uh, so that's, I think, one of the reasons. And in turn, in addition to that, they are also enforcing, uh, they had enforced anti-dumping duties on Chinese products, and uh, right now they are contemplating of replacing it with basic customs duty, which will be substantially higher in the range of 20, 25%. Uh, so all of this adds on, you know, to moving supply chain more indoors. Thanks, sir. Good Thanks good for sir. the insights. So just one, one, uh, one info from my side. The report that I was quoting was from a journal, Environmental Group for Urge World, and that was also quoted by UN Secretary General to give a wrap on an apple to the RDFIs. Sure. But as I said, you know. People reporting, they don't understand uh, what people at the time of decision making, what factors are there. So, so that's why the reports are often, uh, you know, half baked. So if you really want to stay informed, you should go down and see what World Bank has funded in reality. Which projects are they funding? Uh, and you know, for World Bank or for any of these bilateral institutions, this information is publicly available. They make it available for everybody to see. So I think uh, that's the best way you can, uh, you know, judge. So guys, since we are done with all the Q&As, so we can conclude the session now. So Sandeep, on behalf of entire XLRI GMP 2021 batch, uh, thank you once again for taking your time out and that too on a Sunday morning. It's okay. So it, it was nice. again indeed a pleasure interacting with you. So hope to hear you from very soon. Thank you. Thanks, Arishi. Thank you, everyone. It was a wonderful participation and I had a good time. Yes. Thanks, Thank Sandeep. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Thank Sandeep. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you